Hi everyone and welcome to another edition of Common Sense. I'm your host Tom Minicello and it's my privilege today to be uh, here today with Jeff Deal who is running for the open Senate seat here in Massachusetts. Um, Jeff, welcome. Thank you for coming in. Tom, thanks for having me. It's great to have the opportunity to speak with you about uh, you know yourself, your background, the issues and certainly um, what you've accomplished. Um, well, I know you've been here quite a long time as far as a lifelong resident, but also uh, serving in the community and the school board. School for committee, exactly. Yeah, exactly, so thank you for you know, allowing me to come in and talk to your audience as well. We on the school committee refer to ourselves as the red-headed stepchild. <laughs> um, we, um, we do the day-to-day, -day. we come to all the meetings, um, and there are several meetings on the school committee, but. Um, uh, it's, it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting mix of issues that uh, come up. Um, you know, but I actually got my start uh, at, at the Whitman. I'm from the town of Whitman next door, and I was the uh, on the finance committee, the liaison to the school board. So I sort of got to work with them, but didn't have to you know necessarily go through the <laughs> the, the craziness that you go through every day. But I def definitely understood the issues facing education nowadays, as far as finances, curriculum, things like that. Plus the FinCom background was good to have as well. In Brockton, we also um, have the responsibility of negotiating with all of the different unions, so it does take up a lot of time um, away from your regular duties, so um, it never ends. When you go into executive session, I know I'm sure those things go late. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, I want to thank you for obviously serving uh, the community. Uh, you are currently our state rep. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about your background and uh, you know how you came to make that decision to run for rep? Yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting story. I didn't decide to run for office until I was 40 years old. I had two daughters at the time, six and two. And uh, what's funny was I, I grew up and I be was an Eagle Scout at the age of 16. And in Boy Scouts, as people may know, you're, you're taught to kind of give back, leave the campground better than you found it. And I always thought I'd have a boy and I would join a scout troop, become a scout leader, and then um, go to campouts, do things like that. Uh, two daughters who love ballet later, who don't like to camp out at all. How old are they? <laughs> they're, now they're 13 and 9, uh, but they were pretty young at the time. And my wife uh, owns a performing arts school in the town of Hanson, um, Boss Academy. And she actually uh, grew up here in Brockton and went to school over at Denise Buitt's um, uh, dance sure. school on Manley Street. Uh, so, yeah, Kathy Jo Boss, in case anybody knows. But, um, uh, you know, so. I was, uh, she owned the dance studio in Hanson and I was working for a sign design right here on West Chestnut Street in Brockton. Yeah. Uh, the Farinos owned that. And, um, you know, things were going pretty well. We had our house, two young kids, and uh, I decided to get involved in the local finance committee, you know, community oriented. And, uh, you know, I was on there for a few years and the, the state representative that, you know, covered my area um, kept voting to reduce, you know, local aid and Chapter 70 school funds, but at the same time, you know, raising taxes. We had the double taxation on alcohol, for example. And uh, I thought, well, this is really not in line with what's good for the town I'm living in. You know, who's running against this person? And in 08, uh, he was unopposed, um, but it was too late for me to run. So I said, well, what do I have to do? They said, well, just join your local town committee, run for, uh, you know, run. And uh, I did. And in 2010, I ended up winning. And uh, it was uh, an interesting time going up to the State House then. Um, 2011, there was uh, a lot of work being done on uh, the health care coverage, you know, trying to, you know, open municipal health care plans to allow towns to some freedom to um, change the plans so that they could uh, at least make sure that they could afford the coverage. You know, right. it was really a crisis in the state at the time. We were able to work on that immediately. Um, but again, I had really never envisioned running for office, but it was, it was definitely interesting to do it. And, um, you know, now I've been in there for five years, like you mentioned, and, um, you know, a lot of the issues I think I, I work on are, are oriented around making sure that money can stay in the household level first, that money goes back to the, you know, towns and cities first uh, in the form of local aid. Um, you know, we've, I've been voting for a while to, you know, get the Chapter 90 road construction funds released. You know, under the previous governor, we weren't able to get that. Under the new governor, it was one of the first things he did, so $100 million was released. You know, I was definitely in favor of getting that done. Um, but the other thing, too, is taking on some big st uh, statewide issues as well. The, there was a transportation bill a few years ago that passed that included, um, it included a tech tax, which we found was pretty bad, and six weeks later was, um, uh, that was repealed in the well, legislature. I think you'll find that the devil is in the details. Right. And, you know, um, it, takes, it takes strong people, thorough people, to review what's being passed and to make sure that um, you know it's in the best interest of you know the taxpayer and the Commonwealth and you know that's why people send um, their representatives. I mean, um, you know, some of the uh, 
some of the programs that people wanted to pass where um, you know taxes go up based on certain uh, criteria without uh, any checks and balances without any debate without any discussion just based on you know certain financial criteria well wait a minute we put you in office in order to review when taxes should go up why they should go up should there be more efficiency before they you ask the taxpayer is are you know you know just the MBTA is one of them everyone you know once you say the MBTA people snicker and smirk because of you know the lack of service that people you certainly received this winter and they you know cry poor mouth and you find out that basically it's you know people weren't showing up to work uh, they're not buying the right I mean we live in the Northeast Chicago has better equipment to deal with snow ice and all that stuff we don't have that equipment we have are you kidding me I know well, wh who's running the show you know well that's that's exactly it you know again on the finance committee I was uh, very thorough with looking at the line item budgets and at the state house I was on ways and means my first term uh, and I felt the same you have to look at these these line items very carefully and so we found in that transportation bill just you know like you're saying there was really less scrutiny than there should have been on on what they were trying to pass so not only the tech tax but they increased a tax on cigarettes I don't know how that relates to transportation but they they added that in there and then the third thing they did was raise the gas tax uh, by three cents but they slipped in there uh, an indexing where it would go up every year automatically without a vote forever right. exactly. uh, and the legislators would never have to be responsible for that tax increase ever again it would just go on every year there's no other tax in Massachusetts that goes up automatically and this would be one of them and we weren't debating the three cents we understood that you know there was a need to kind of continually index up your uh, your gas tax with the times keeping up with the times it had been quite a few years since it had been increased however what we didn't like was that there would just be an increase every year automatically and it was a regressive tax and that was the other thing we really tried to debate and they shot down during that day in which I ended up working on ballot question one uh, this last well, year. Well you worked very hard on that. Well I got to be the uh, spokesman and co-chairman on that and debated three different mayors um, Seti Warren out of Newton, uh, Kim Driscoll out of Salem uh, and um, uh, Joe Kiritoni from Somerville. We, he and I debated three times on uh, uh, TV and radio before the elections came up in November and each time we just kept bringing up the same points and this doesn't help people uh, as far as it's not just what you pump into your gas tank it, it's all the purchases you make you know the food and goods that you purchase have to go up because of the cost to transport sure. them and your municipalities aren't exempt from the gas tax okay so all your school buses police cruisers fire trucks we're gonna have a higher increase to the tune of two billion dollars across the state so you just divide that among right. 351 cities I mean, and towns. School buses are near and dear to my heart. I can tell you that you know every uh, few years we have to redo the contract with you know our provider, and every year it goes up substantially because of you know the cost of fuel. Um, but you know you know the fuel right now is you know reasonably priced. I guess you know some people would say it's still high, but um, you know compared to you know close to 389, 390, um, you know 225 looks pretty darn good. But um, I mean, when when they put in things like that, it makes um, communities have to make hard choices. A, do you start charging the students and their families? In Brockton, as you know, you know we have um, quite a few families that uh, are needy um, and are not able to pay. So do we say to them, you can't come on the bus because you don't have the three hundred and fifty dollars this year to pay for the bus? Or do we cut out routes? You know, basically make um, you know everybody do, have to walk. If, yeah, you know. I mean, you know, cut out high school busing. Right. Legally, high school busing is not uh, mandated by law. You know, it's only elementary busing, middle school busing as well. So, right. do we basically have you know kids walking from you know the Brookfield area or the Ashfield area or the Downey area all the way to the high school? And what is going to be the you know the rate of absence with kids not being able to get to school? Yeah. And so there's like you said, there's a you know there's a cost and there's an effect. And, and the McKinney Vento federal law that which requires that we pay for homeless the state pays for homeless school busing as well uh, you know has been cut from it's supposed to be at minimum 11 million it keeps getting cut down to 7 million each year so you know that's another area where lower gas costs thankfully right now maybe we can do a little bit better job but truthfully you know if it had kept going up automatically it would have just made it harder to do the homeless school busing. Yeah, I, I have a real problem with McKinney Vento um, you know I, I get the um, you know the reasoning but I'm sorry if you have a, a, a family that is from Brockton and for whatever reason is placed in Fall River then this community cannot afford to bus transport that student from Fall River to Brockton every day for the rest of the year and what really annoys me is when we're paying the actual parent 
to drive the student because sometimes it's cheaper right. to have the parent drive the student from Fall River to Brockton. Well, I'm sorry. If, if, if I'm presented with the option that my student can still come to Brockton and if it means so much to me, then as the parent there should be some responsibility or onus on you to basically either you do the driving because if you're available to drive um, and get paid for it from the community and you feel it's so worthwhile for your student to come to Brockton, that's fine. But you should basically, that should be your, your, on your part you know, you should have to contribute something for us to keep the seat for your student instead of passing it on to the taxpayer. I mean, we have kids coming from Wareham up, um, and vice versa. Wareham has kids coming from right. Brockton. I mean, so it's not just a Brockton it's problem. It, it's it's insane. Yeah, it's, it's insane. And, and the Commonwealth, you know, basically mandates it. And like you said, they cut back every year. Yeah. Well, the the Fed the Fed's man, uh, mandated, yeah. and the Commonwealth uh, shorts the funds, so then it becomes the town responsibility right. to pick up the the back end of that, and it's but always people don't more realize that. Right. People don't realize that you know, we, you know, we could be shipping kids from Brockton to the Cape or what have you. I mean, it it makes no sense. You know, you're entitled to a, a free public education, um, but you know, there there's no mandatory uh, you know necessity that it be from a particular place. I mean, you know, if, if you're relocated but you opt to do that, fine. But the onus should be on you as the parent. You should have some responsibility or stake in this. And that's what I think people are getting tired of, that there's so much going out and people not putting in their um, effort, their sweat equity, their contributing. Everyone relies on, you know, someone else to foot the bill. Yeah. No, it's a general distrust in D.C. as well as, yeah, you know, absolutely. here up on Beacon Hill. And it's, you know, it's the fact that I think people aren't always willing to stand up on the big issues and push back and say this is a bad idea. You know, we had a budget shortfall this last year and had to make, you know, the governor had to make nine C cuts, you know, to the tune of about $768 million. But at the same time, just six months earlier, the legislature proposed to do an expansion of the Boston Convention Center at the t to the cost of a billion dollars when the convention center had been losing money every year the current industry trends are showing that trade uh, trade show industry is going down and yet they wanted to expand an already you know adequate convention center and so that's where people go why, why are they making decisions that are not good for our communities it's just good for the power brokers up on beacon yeah. hill i mean and and that's the problem today you know all people today want are their representatives people who are up there representing their community to show a little common sense, a little backbone, um, and just do what a normal, um, thoughtful person would do in a similar situation. But it seems that when you have someone else's checkbook, you're, you know, you're freewheeling. Um, you know, I, I would say, you know, uh, this country, this community of Brockton is one of the most generous giving communities there is. We provide so much to so many kids and families that have so little. But at some point you say, you know, you've got to stop the abuse so that there are these resources to put towards the needy, to put towards the people that truly um, are suffering or need some help. Um, and you know, that's what goes up the craw of people when they see the abuse. I mean, I was in uh, Market Basket one day and there was a guy in front of me using an EBT card to buy three large pre-cooked lobsters from the fish counter. I was with my wife and I said, oh, watch this. They're going to tell him, you, you can't buy this. You're gonna, I'm, I'm thinking this is going to be interesting to see how he's going to have to put this back. Absolutely not. It was if he was paying with cash. See you later. No, you know, no milk, no cereal, no bread, no eggs three pre-cooked lobsters and you're sitting there going you're kidding me right on the taxpayer dime well, so I that's mean, when you're disgusted yeah I mean the social programs are there in place to help people who need it and it's just it, when they get abused that's when people get very angry as well you know uh, public housing is another thing I've put an amendment in to try to make sure that we match the federal requirement of a social security number if you're gonna you know be eligible for public housing but the legislature continues to shoot that down. It's insane. But see, that's when people, normal people, go insane. Like, mm -hmm. what are you crazy? Right. What, why shouldn't you prove that you are a citizen of this country? Why shouldn't you have to give a social security number? And, and this is why, um, this is why Donald Trump is doing so well. Hey. Because because normal people, the silent majority, are finally saying, you know, the politicians that are in there are you know, turning their backs, doing nothing, and you know, he might not have all the answers, but 
what he's saying is, is basically making sense. The question is, can he do it? How could he ever do what he's saying? But, but he's hitting all the, all the right buttons because people are fed up with, you know, you go to work, you work hard every day, you try to provide for your family, and you see the nonsense. And there's, at this point in time in this country, there's too much nonsense. We've gotten to the tipping point where, where people have no faith in the system and people are basically saying, everyone else is scamming, why shouldn't I? Yeah. That's what's sad today. They don't want career politicians in there making decisions that are best for their party. They want uh, people that are real people. You know, if it's not going to be Donald Trump that's the nominee, at least maybe he'll rub off on a, a nominee that, uh, or somebody from the party that uh, mm -hmm. maybe reflects a little bit more uh, of a mainstream values, but I think Donald is certainly saying the things that people are are thinking, and it's just you know uh, a lot of times people don't want to hear that. That, yeah. that can be the problem too. But yeah, no, I mean the other thing too was um, just this last year we had the potential for the 2024 Olympics to come to Boston. Yeah, you were you were a big voice in that. And I worked with uh, Evan Falchuk, who was the uh, candidate from the uh, Independent Party that ran for governor this last year partnered with him on getting the language put together that we would put in place uh, first in the legislature. I filed it in the House. It was shot down. And then uh, it was filed in the Senate, shot down. So we ended up uh, filing it with the Secretary of State as a ballot question. And what it was going to do is put the taxpayer protection in place so that the overruns, which we knew there was going to be overruns with the Olympics, there has been ever since 1960, and the average percentage is 179 percent. So the budgeted 14.5 uh, billion dollar Olympics would have easily put another 8 to 10 billion dollars on the taxpayers, which would have been a big dig part two. But let me ask you that. Yeah. I mean, you heard a lot with Marty Walsh talking about Boston, but it wouldn't have just been Boston on the hook, correct? So here's the, this, is, this is really what really it got down to the weeds was um, they kept trying to think the organizers say of, of a way to get around this taxpayer protection because they knew that we as a political force would have gotten that ballot question in place to say no taxpayer funds for the Olympics. Most everybody understood that this was a boondoggle um, of all boondoggles because it only benefits a few developers that, sure. that make a ton of yeah, money off yeah, building yeah, temporary absolutely. states. Even uh, Congressman Lynch you know, was way against, you know, temporary stadiums being put in his district. And so, you know, he spoke out against that. Um, when you have a big dig project where they take out the fill and charge to take out the fill, and then they sell the same fill back at ten times the price of what they charge to, you know, people are a little skeptical get, and rightly should be. They get nervous when, the, when they see things like that. And the proposals for the, for the Olympics were crazy. They at first said it was going to be all in Boston and it would be a walkable Olympics. And then when they realized that wasn't selling, they started to parcel it out. But it's not out. possible. It's not it's possible. Not even, it's not even not selling. It's they don't have the uh, capacity. Right. Boston, you, you needed to go to outside venues because there's no way. Well, and transportation was in, in shambles. And, you know, I can get back to the gas tax on that. And we can second, get back to the MBTA and yeah, how well they perform. Uh, clearly, th that was going to require billions in investment to get it up to speed in just seven years. We can't do it for decades, and somehow in seven years we're going to make Boston a fully trans you know, transportation-friendly city for international visitors. So they started to move it out to you know Bedford for sailing, to Bill Ricca for the gun uh, gun events, uh, all sorts of places they were going to do all these things. And what they were thinking was, well, let okay, uh, we'll do a giant insurance package, and then all these cities and, and uh, towns can do insurance for the events they've got. But it was like a Ponzi scheme because, quite honestly, all the the insurance, the cost for insuring that for any of these towns is more than most of their budgets are for their town annually. So there was no financial way it could happen. Um, it ultimately was going to require that the governor and mayor sign an indemnity that the state would take care of the overruns. And when neither of them was willing to you do heard it, more they left. Boston getting stuck with the bill, but like you said, the state would also get stuck with well, the Boston, bill. Well, Boston, the overruns al alone would exceed what Boston had right. spends annually for their budget, so there was no financial way they could yeah. have bonded against right. any overruns. So it, it had to be the state ultimately, it had to be the governor. You know, right. he, he put a, a, a study out to bid, and, and uh, the Brattle Group is actually going to be reporting at some point what their findings were, but we anticipate what we knew all along, which was that this state just couldn't afford the overruns, and if they did, it was going to have to be on our backs. And mm -hmm. it would have been, you know, a 30, 20, 30 year bond of massive payments to, to pay back for having the Olympics for three weeks. It was just a mistake. I was at the airport this morning at 4 o'clock dropping my son off. When I was coming back at 5.30 in the morning, I looked to my wife and I said, who are these people coming in the other direction? I was, you know, heading back home. Yeah. And when I hit the Braintree split, it was already stopped. <laughs> when I hit the Braintree split, it was moving, you know, slow, but it's still moving on the expressway in. But once I hit that Braintree split, I'm like, this is 530. 
Uh, so imagine what things would be like with an Olympics. Oh, my father-in-law told me back when I first got married to my wife. He's like, as long as you hit the uh, you know 93 and uh, you know going into the city at four, you know five o'clock, maybe six, <laughs> six o'clock, you'll be okay. Now there is no time you can get up anymore. People are on mm. you know changing schedules. And getting back to the T, you know, the commuter rail is not exactly, um, you know, uh, working like they wanted to. I mean, it's been, you know, massively uh, underfunded as far as maintenance. You know, they're they're at a, a three billion dollar maintenance backlog for the T, on top of, you know, not bringing in enough operating costs to cover them. So we're one of, we're one of the most subsidized uh, public transit systems, you know, in the country. We're, we really rank down at the bottom as far as, you know, how much the ridership actually pays for this thing. Well, I I, I haven't analyzed the T, so I'm, you know, I'm certainly not going to say I'm. I'm an expert at the T, but I think the normal person basically has in the back of their craw that so much of the T goes to salaries, benefits, retirements. What's left to maintain this thing? Right. And and the the the, the maintenance gets crumbs because of because no one trusts it because everyone looks at it as if every you know wink wink this is this is the best. Uh, this is the best boondoggle in town. If you can get a job at the T when you're, you know, in your teens, you can uh, retire you can re by 40 Hello? with a full pension. And I know, and it was crazy. And then on top of that, they, the current contract they have with Keolis, they don't necessarily get paid to collect or not collect fares. So if there was a hundred million dollars lost in fares last year. They estimate um, the the maintenance was deferred for years. And yet, here's the crazy part. Okay, so when the gas tax ballot question was going on, and I was debating these mayors, they said, "Well, you know, some of the money goes to you know public transit from the gas tax." I said, "I know it's." Four 49%. Almost 50% of your gas tax gets sent to the T. You know, people don't really talk about that. Well, well, the T needs that money. Okay, great. You know, let's just say that they ha they need that money and they're not doing the job with it. Well, the fact of the matter is when this uh, blizzard hit this last winter yeah. and G Governor Baker took over, he put a, a select team together to investigate what happened, including um, uh, Mayor Sullivan from Braintree was on that team. And they found that there was $2.2 billion dollars of money available to the T that their management wasn't even able to spend. They just were so mis disorganized and unmanaged. They didn't even know that they had these funds available or were able to use them for the backlog of maintenance or for better operations. Or, and so for, a, or for adequate equipment. Uh, like, I, like I said in the beginning, Chicago, you know, that, that train system, you know, I think it's the L. Um, the they, elevated, yep. They run you know, in worse weather than us, the winds in Chicago coming off the Great Lakes will, you know, will freeze you in one spot while you're trying to walk. They can somehow get it done and get the equipment to melt the snow and to clear the tracks. But yet, the geniuses in Boston needed to go out there to figure out what they're doing. How, I mean, you've got to be kidding me. So here's they're, they're doing it this year? Where have they been? So, like, here's an interesting... Um, two different numbers that will blow your mind. In um, uh, Minnesota, there's the public rail system. They operate with the same number of riders that we do in Massachusetts, and they do it for half the cost, again, in winter weather that's worse than ours. Yeah. Now, New Jersey has twice the number of riders and do it for the same money that we spend. You know, the New Jersey transit into New York and, and, and around the state. So you look at both. We, we spend as much as New Jersey and can only transport half. We spend uh, twice as much as, we have the same ridership as Minnesota and we do it for twice the cost. So I mean, mm -hmm. we really are way out of whack in, in how we manage our rail. We, we're one of the oldest rail in the country and yet, so we should be one of the best. Uh, and yet we're, we're really lagging behind just about everybody yeah, else. Yeah, you'd say we should have the experience to figure it out. <laughs> that's right. And that's why we need serious people like yourself to run for an office, you know, such as this, a state senator. Um, yeah, it's not, you know, the thing about government is it shouldn't be about, um, I, I don't think, you, you know, you really should be making the roads, you know, should be paved, the schools should be opened, you should be doing the mundane things that keep people, you know, make sure your public safety is up to the, the current levels you need as far as staffing for police, you know, f what the firefighters need for their, their uh, equipment, make sure that stuff's in place and just do your job, you know, yeah, as a legislator. Yeah. Research where the money's going, make sure it's going the right place, uh, and then vote the way, you know, is best for your towns. That's all people should that's really That's all expect. people want, and that's right. all they want. They just want people to, um, you know, you know, make decisions that, uh, you know, sitting around your kitchen table would make sense. I mean, they're not looking for miracles. They're not looking for people to split atoms. It's just, you know, like you said, keep the roads going, you know, educate the kids, keep the trains running on time. Um, uh, health care. Hey, another real quick thing is health care. Um, we switched from a fully working health care connector that people could go and get their, their health care uh, plans from the state, and we switched over to the Affordable Care Act two years ago. It, immediately, the website didn't work. I mean, of all things, this crazy website doesn't work. For over a year, people were kicked off their plans, and then the state had to reimburse 
people for coverage that they were able to pay for themselves, but because they couldn't sign up, we, we had to pay for it. So it was over a billion dollars that went right out the table because we were, were sort of asked by the federal government to adopt the Affordable Care Act. Now, we already were the leader in the nation on providing that health care, and here we are throwing away something that was working. It was like, if it's not broken, you know, don't fix it. Right. And, and that's the mentality that was going on for years. And that's kind of what I want to stop in the Senate is making bad decisions um, so that we don't end up paying the price down the road for these things. Yeah, I mean, Massachusetts is one of the highest uh, priced health care around. I mean, we had, you know, uh, under Governor Romney, they put in, you know, the Obama Romney care, whatever you want to call it. Um, but yet, if you look at um, a 15-year window, you will see every single year your health care goes up. Um, and it doesn't go up by pennies. It goes up by real dollars. I mean, today, a family plan is like $2,200. That's a mortgage payment. I'm right. sorry. So, I mean, how do normal people afford that if, you know, they are not getting it subsidized through their employer or they're a municipal, state, or federal employee? I mean... Well, look what it does to employers. It forces them, obviously, higher costs to operate, so their goods have to cost yeah. more, so we're less competitive around the country with what we produce. And, at the same time, uh, you know, employers... Um, have to, uh, you know, if they if they go past a certain threshold of employees, they have to pay more as well. So you know, you almost disincentivize a business to grow right. because the more employees they have, the higher their costs right. are going to be for these plans. So it it really is a, a negative cycle we're in because of the health care uh, plan and even the the quote unquote Catholic plans that the unions have are about to be whacked. Absolutely. And and they Absolutely. know it. And, and they, they, yeah, again, yeah. I'll reference... And they all supported it. Congress That's what I love about it. Except they Congressman all supported Lynch, them. Congressman Lynch took an unpopular vote against the Affordable Care Act. Thank good God for him for being a voice of reason because he said he knew it was going to do to the unions. Yeah. It was going to really hurt them in their plans. But you're right. Originally, that they were all for it. And, and now they're, yeah. you know, looking... Oh, now, at, they're, now they're looking their wounds and saying, what the hell did we do? Yeah. So, so we have to correct it, and thankfully we have a governor, I think, in place that you know comes from the healthcare yeah. industry. is going to be looking yeah. at this as well. So that's a good, good. Uh, thing. So we always have fun, and our time goes. <laughs> so we we actually have to wrap up. Okay. We have a, a couple of minutes. So what would you like to, message? Would you like to tell the uh, the viewers? Yeah. Well, I think what people should know is um, first of all that you know I've always been since serving in office uh, focused on what's best for the households, the families, not any one party or a special interest up on Beacon Hill. And the other thing that. Um, People can tell you know I tell people it's a short special election. November 3rd is the election day, so it's really about two and a half months, depending on when you see this, uh, two to two and a half months away. And um, I have a website if people want to get involved in the campaign to learn more yeah, about why don't you me. Tell people what it is, uh, which is uh, jeffdeal.com, and it's spelled a little differently. So it's www. G e o f f d i e h l dot com. That's jeffdeal dot com, and uh, you can visit the website to learn more about me. Uh, to you know, get my information on how to contact me anytime you want. I'm happy to talk to people 24/7. And then the uh, other thing is how you can help to volunteer if you're interested in learning. You know, getting involved in the campaign itself. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of students too that uh, are taking political science courses everywhere, and they might want to jump on board, get a little experience. I mean, you certainly uh, are a proven entity. You you know are currently state rep, so uh, you certainly know what you're doing, and you know by all accounts you're you're advocating for the taxpayer, and that's that's basically what needs to be done today. I well, mean, I'm hoping the message uh, you know gets out there that, and I uh, thank you for having me here because that's it. It's really just about common sense, like your show is called, and and doing it. the right thing. Well, thanks for coming in. I really appreciate so. it. Appreciate it.